Good morning and welcome to the seventh meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2019. Can I please ask everyone in the public gallery to switch off your electronic devices or turn them to silent so they don't affect the committee's work this morning? Item number one is decision on taking business in private. Do members agree to take items three and four in private? Yeah, Thank you. Item two is post-legislative scrutiny of the Control of Dogs Scotland Act 2010. I'd like to welcome our witnesses to the committee's meeting this morning. Jim Ferguson, Amenities Services Officer, Argyle and Butte Council. Bill, sorry, Bill Gilchrist, Team Leader, Environment Health, East Ayrshire Council. Linda Gray, Assistant Manager of Public Health, South, Neighbourhoods and Sustainability, Glasgow City Council. Alistair Lee, where's Alistair? There you are. Senior Environment Health Officer, North Lanarkshire Council. Kay Watson, Dog Control Officer of Fife Council. You're all very welcome. Um, we have a lot of issues to cover this morning, so we're going to move straight to questioning. I'm going to ask Colin Beattie to open questioning for the committee. Um, in previous evidence sessions, the the issue of licensing of dogs was discussed and it was suggested that any such licensing scheme would be self-funding and might assist in uh, uh, better funding the, the dog warden system. So the proceeds would have to be, re would have to be ring fenced. There was also a thought that uh, dog owners should have to pass some sort of a competency test uh, before obtaining that license. What, what do you think about the introduction of a licensing system? Um, I, I would suggest through, through, uh, through you, Chair, that uh, a licensing system would, in my opinion, be quite effective if it was coupled with the compulsory uh, microchipping of dogs, where the applicant for a licence, um, prior to issue of that licence, would require to demonstrate that a dog had been microchipped and provide to the local authority a copy of the number and the details of the database in which that uh, information was stored. So yes, in my opinion, on behalf of East Ayrshire, I would suggest that would be a valuable exercise, yes. Yeah, we discussed this at our Island Butte uh, Council, and we feel the same, that the microchipping regulations was a, could be a prelude to a form of licensing, which would allow uh, us to trace ownership and accountability uh, with regards to dog ownership. So, yeah, we would support that. Is that uh, the opinion of the rest of the panel? Definitely, yeah. We quite strongly agree that licensing is a good way to, to be able to police, uh, prove ownership of dogs, etc., and be able to trace dogs when they're moved on. How would you manage that within the council? I mean, the implication of a dog licensing system is that there would be a process whereby uh, someone would have to be determined as being a, a fit and proper person to hold that licence. How, how would you manage that through the council? In a practical sense, we'd present quite a few difficulties because the number of dog uh, licence applications which the local authority would receive would put a, a very heavy burden on the resources of the council to administer, first of all, and secondly, to ensure that the training which the person had received to become a fit and proper person was adequate and by a recognised body who, in the opinion of the local authority, was competent to deliver that training. How many dogs are, do, you, do you estimate are within your area? Uh, I know it can only be a guesstimate, but... Uh... Well, I, I think in terms of East Ayrshire, um, we, we, we did a rough kind of account based on you know information that we had received through... Um, community surveys and that kind of thing. And East Ayrshire is a semi-rural area. We have two sort of fairly large uh, urban areas, Kilmarnock and Cumnock. Uh, but other than that, it's pretty much a rural area. But even at that, we would estimate we have in the region of forty to 50,000 dogs wow. in the area. Basically, I estimate we have probably one in three households has a dog. Um, that would probably equate to around about 50,000 dogs within North Lanarkshire. In the Island Butte area, I would say, when I, when I moved there 15 years ago, uh, what caught my eye was the amount of dog ownership. But when you look at Argyll Island Butte and its terrain and its coastlines and what have you, you know, people, it's an ideal place for a dog. And I've never seen so many dog owners. There's a huge amount of dog owners. Most of them responsible, I must say. Mm. Uh, but with that, you get uh, problems with other ones. 
With the dog licensing system, clearly there's logistical problems around this, although the vast majority of licenses presumably would just auto-renew as uh, other licenses do through the council. It would only be where there's a challenge, presumably, from the police or the council or whatever to a renewal of a licence, that it would actually start to chew up resources. Would that be correct? It would depend if the if part of getting the license is to ensure that the person is um, sort of competent to own a dog or to you know be in charge of a dog. Then, for every license application, you would still have that at the outset. So I think it would still then impact on the resource for the local authority. Given the number of dogs here that we're, we're looking at, would that not raise a substantial amount of revenue, which would allow for a, a proper administration of the scheme? You would hope so. But again, I think even the practical implications of making sure that you had adequate resource that were adequately um, prepared to be able to carry out the test, if you like, of the, the uh, person to be uh, deemed to be suitable to have a dog. I think even that initially, um, it would kind of front load um, the sort of burden initially, um, which hopefully over time would then sort of balance out. But I think initially it would still be quite problematic. So if the uh, going back to what you were saying before, if there's a consensus among the panel that a dog licensing system is good, how would you how would you handle it? How would you administer it? You're telling me the problems. Mm -hmm. What's the solution? It would, it would have to be self-financing, uh, and I think if we were going to go down the route of dog licences, there would be quite a lot of work to be done. I don't think anybody in the room has got the answer. Basically, how are we going to make it work? But it's workable. It could be made to work. Uh, so I think uh, if we did, we did go down that road, it would be useful, and uh, but it would have to be self-financing. It would take a lot of resources. Mm. I guess even before the licensing regime was in place, you could do the preparatory work in terms of um, perhaps doing some training for staff that were already in existence. But if you're relying on the resource of the licenses to then generate the resource to carry it out, it's going to be difficult to be able to be up and running as soon as the licensing regime was in place. Mm. Um, so there would perhaps need to be uh, something looked at whether there was potential to have particular uh, funding set aside even to get that kind of kick started. Mm. So you, you, you would really need to get resources from the council itself in advance in order to be able to afford to start the scheme so you can start taking the money in yeah. to make I think, it I think otherwise it would be difficult for it to be a meaningful scheme uh -huh. if you're not going to have the resource to be able to check. The, thing, the reason that we're seeing the licensing, talking about responsible ownership, mm. if you're just going to be able to get a licence just by paying a fee to get a licence without those checks, then mm. we already had that a long time ago and it didn't really um, sort of make any difference. Um, and then that was kind of scrapped. So I think you really need to have the second element um, at the very outset of it if you're going to have that in place. I mean, sort of in my mind from the discussions in, in previous sessions, it was in my mind it would be an annual licence. Is that ambitious? Yes. Given the number of dogs which any, any one of the authorities would see, clearly seem to have, to, re, to, to renew a licence annually would be a massive administrative burden on the councils and um, a resource bur uh, burden on the enforcement authorities who would actually challenge any unlicensed dogs. Because I think, from my perspective, we do have a large number of people within the community who are responsible dog owners, who lift their dog poop, they you know look after their animals, they, you know, they make sure they're regularly vet checked, and they do anything that they are required to do in terms of the law. The problem for the local authorities, in my opinion, would be the irresponsible dog owners who get a dog from their friend around the corner, keep it six months, move it on, uh, and they do nothing in terms of animal welfare or responsible dog ownership with that animal. Uh, and that, to me, is the problem that local authorities would face, not the responsible dog owners who would license their dog, have them microchipped, etc., etc. It's the irresponsible dog owners within the community who get a dog because they, they fancy it for six months, get fed up with it and, you know, essentially throw it out the door. How, how would you handle a situation where each, each council presumably would have its own database of the dogs within its area? Perhaps when a person moves to another area, would it have to be a national database that they feed into or is it, would there be some sort of a process, could there be some sort of process for that dog transferring across? When they control the Dogs Act, uh, 
I was involved in this eight and a half years ago. It's amazing how the years fly by. But we did have plans back then for a national database for dog control notices. Uh, but the technicalities and expense put that to bed. It never actually happened. So a national database for most things is a challenge, and certainly a national database for licences would be useful. But I'm not quite sure if it would fall by the wayside the same way as the other one. But it would be something that would be useful. OK. Um, OK. Can I just say at this point, we found your evidence that you provided us with, written evidence, extremely useful. So can I thank you for that? You know, it g g gave us real insight after hearing the stories from uh, people who had uh, experienced dog attacks both on their animals and on their children. So it was extremely useful. But on the back of uh, Colin Beatty's question, can I ask the panel, did I hear correctly from that evidence you just gave that all the councils represented here are in favour of a dog licensing scheme or some sort of different scheme to administrate dog control? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. And as Sarwar, you had a supplementary to that. Just, yes. just to follow up on that, I think, I, mean, I think in principle I support that licensing scheme as well. I'm just concerned about the figures around 40,000 and 50,000 and two local authorities. Sounds like we're talking about maybe between half a million to a million dogs across Scotland. Um, is it realistic to have a fully licensed compulsory scheme? And isn't there a risk that the very people who are going to be the most irresponsible dog owners will be the ones that dodge the compulsory scheme anyway? Isn't that a risk? I agree with that. Mm -hmm. I think it would be quite a high risk that, as has been said before, all your responsible dog owners will be the first ones that will sign up for the scheme and, and apply for a licence. But the irresponsible dog owners are the ones that we want to focus on. will be the ones that will just ignore it. And it would be up to us to try and identify those dog owners to then obviously take action to either enforce the dog licence scheme. Uh, but we've got to have the powers to be able to do that. And same again, it's a huge resource because then that's the manual labour of trying to identify who these dog owners are. And, and just to follow up to that, Kay Watson, is at the moment the resource is going into identifying irresponsible dogs and, uh, and dog owners in terms of incidents taking place, isn't there a risk that if it becomes the focus turns to policing the system rather than policing the bad dogs, you could then be targeting dog owners and dogs that are not going to the compulsory scheme but perhaps might not be the most dangerous ones and therefore you're spreading the resource even thinner? Um, and as a consequence, um, what le I think Colin asked this question and there wasn't really an answer and that's not a criticism because it's a, a difficult one, but it sounds like this needs a huge scale of investment to preload before it's a self-sustaining system. Um, so I suppose the first part to, to yourself, Kay, and the second part to, to the local authorities represented, is what level of guesstimate have you made about how much would be required to put such a system into place? I'd have to say, certainly, from a ministerial perspective, that hasn't been considered. Uh, I would doubt very much other authorities have You're done the same millions? thing. I simply couldn't put a figure on it. Um, it would really, as has already been said and, and corroborated, you know, the responsible dog owners will sign up for this. Mm. I mean, there is a already existing legislation in the Control of Dogs um, Order, I think it's um, 1992, where dogs are required by law to have a disc with the, the name and address of the owner on it. That, that could also be implemented as part of an amended scheme where when a, a licence is issued, a dog is also issued with an identifiable tag which highlights to anyone just from sort of looking at it that it already has that registration and licence in place and it can perhaps sort of diffuse the situation slightly and that local authorities can then more readily target those dogs which are not displaying a tag. Um, so that there are sort of ways around it where you know if a dog is licensed it has a tag and the responsible owner will wear it and we then have the opportunity to randomly target those dogs which are not displaying the, the appropriate disc. Uh, and just finally, Chair, sorry, with your permission, uh, uh, is there possibly an argument to say that we recognise that those that are the responsible dog owners are the ones that are likely to sign up for the scheme, but actually having a scheme and building up a resource through that scheme can help provide money to, to better police the bad dog owners? Is that is that a reasonable argument to make? Yes, that is. Yeah. 
think so. I um, also think at the moment there's insufficient resource across the country to actually deal with the dogs that you were talking about that are the problematic ones. So to then put on top of that the licensing without having the additional resource, there is already a lack of resource to tackle the issues <coughs> with the problematic dogs. Thank you. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning. Uh, that point you just made, Linda Gray, is really interesting um, because th this funding issue, th th there's, we've had quite a lot of evidence that uh, the lack of funding and resources at the moment precludes your complying uh, or enforcing what you're supposed to do in the first place, let alone bringing in a further uh, licensing scheme. So are you able to help the committee understand what are the current challenges in terms of funding? Uh, or what would extra funding allow you to do that you're not able to do at the moment? I think from my perspective, it's a very specialist role. I don't think it's it's something that's just uh, able to be picked up by um, just any enforcement officer, because even the legislation says, you know, it's got to be someone that's skilled in the control of dogs and able to then pass that kind of advice and information on to others. And I don't think everyone's necessarily got those skills at the outset. So even in terms of the kind of resources we've got, um, you're, you're kind of, I think the role itself, um, even for future, I would prefer if it was a sort of dedicated role that looked at this area of work rather than it being tagged on to another part of, say, for example, environmental health work within the public health realm. Mm -hmm. Um, so even perhaps like uh, funding, etc., would allow a dedicated resource to look at that. Having spoken to colleagues and other authorities where that is what they do, you can see that there's quite a difference in the level of activity in this area of work. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to go? <clears throat> it's a topical subject just now at Agile and Butte where uh, the demands remain as they've been for the past, well, introduction of Control of Dogs Act in 26th February 2011. Uh, and there's a uh, immediate services officer as a generic name for dog control, pest control and environmental enforcement. So we've been relatively unscathed for the nine of us in the past number of years, but the budget's just been set in our authority and we're going from nine to four. And I'm not entirely sure who the four's going to be, but I'm not entirely sure how that's going to work, uh, how these roles are going to be. So in the, in the topic of challenges and funding, uh, yeah, the dark cloud has come across us, so we'll have to just uh, go on with it. Just before I move on, uh, <coughs> Jim Ferguson, you talked about a national database, uh, and I think you mentioned within that that there was a funding challenge around that. Uh, is that something that, were this to be resourced in a different way, uh, such that there were more resource, that a national database suddenly becomes a possibility? Yes, uh, the national database was very much uh, supported uh, and continues, if you look at the Control of Dogs Act 2010, it still, it still features on the, the front page, but it just hasn't uh, came yet to fruition. And I believe it was technical reasons and funding reasons for that. Uh, but we've got by, we've got by, we've got by with what we've got. Mm -hmm. So, but we'll certainly support any move to introduce a national database uh, and, uh, and for licensing as well. You know, with 32 local authorities, and it's good to be able to have a national database. But it still features on, still features on here. It's not going to be. Unless anyone else wants to come in on that point, I'll move to Kay Watson, if I may, just to, with your Fife Council hat on, uh, because the submission from Fife Council takes a slightly different line, uh, insofar as uh, you, Fife Council has made full use of the powers. Uh, in your submission to, uh, and you've issued various dog control notices and various warning letters. Um, but obviously Fife Council faces the same funding challenges and funding decisions uh, that everyone else will face. So uh, how, how has that balance been struck? Why, why is there a different outcome? I think with Fife Council, we originally started off with six dog control officers. And over the years, that has been gradually whittled down with, with budget cuts and things like that. But we still do have two full-time dedicated dog, dog control officers. All we deal with is dog complaints. Uh, so I think that allows us to fully investigate every complaint that uh, comes in. It allows us the time to monitor. It allows us the time to patrol areas, etc., cetera, for, for dangerous and out-of-control dogs. Uh, from a funding point of view, why, how Fife Council have got that funding, I don't know. 
Uh, but as I say, we have been subject to cuts, but at the same time, we've still got the resources there to be able to enforce the, the legislation that's available to us. So just to conclude from that, uh, so I accept the point about licensing, I accept the point about national database. Uh, do we conclude really that the operation of the Act, uh, at least at your level, comes down to resourcing and where were resource to be available, finance and resource, uh, then the outcomes that we were seeing uh, a couple of weeks ago, for example, could be very different. Is that a fair conclusion? Yes. Thank you. Can I ask um, questions of the local authority about interaction with Police Scotland? Now, I know the police are here and they're going to give evidence on the next panel, they're sitting behind you, but I think it's in everyone's interest, both local authorities, police and public, that the work we are doing on this committee aims to get this right and we really need to hear what's happening. But we had in the written submissions um, quite a few references to this situation where dog attacks are being kind of pinged back from councils to the police and then back again. And there seems to be a perception as well, I think it was in Glasgow's submission, that there is perhaps reluctance for prosecutions under the Dangerous Dogs Act and then it's been referred back to councils to put a dog control notice on. Can can you give me a wee bit of a flavour of, is there a problem in terms of where responsibility lies for dog control? Do the councils and police properly understand that because it's interesting that this has come up in your written evidence because this is also what we've heard from the public we did three public meetings one in dalkeith one in airdrie wasn't it and one in dundee and we heard this all the time as well that the public aren't sure who is ultimately responsible so can i open that up to the panel uh, national protocol which has been developed by Police Scotland, the National Dog Warden Association, the, um, the Society of Chief Officers of, Envi of Environmental Health, the Crown Office and the Fiscal Service, which outlines, in my opinion, very clearly where responsibilities for taking action, uh, either under Dangerous Dogs Act or Dog, uh, the Control of Dogs Act, lie. Um, so from our, our, my perspective, certainly, it's very clearly stated within the protocol which uh, body will be responsible for taking action in a certain set of circumstances. Um, what we have found in, in a local perspective in East Ayrshire is that the, for want of a better expression, beat cops are less aware of the uh, existence of the protocol and the content of, of the same. And what we have done when we have had occasion where there is some debate over which authority would be responsible provided local officers with copies of the protocol. Um, and a local perspective as well, if we do serve a dog control notice, we would always send a copy to National uh, Police Headquarters in Pitt Street in Glasgow, the local divisional command, and to the local police office in whose area the incident is taking place and the notice has been served. So I, I would have to say, from an East Ayrshire perspective, we have a very good working relationship with Police Scotland and with the local fiscal service. Uh, who are only too happy to discuss with us any concerns we have and provide any information we need. So, That's good to hear. Um, Linda Gray, I'm going to put you on the spot here. I think you probably guessed that. But in Glasgow's submission, can I just read this? It says there are an increasing number of referrals to local authorities from police, mm -hmm. procurator fiscal for dogs that have caused serious injuries. Um, where the case has failed. This is often inappropriate as the control of dogs legislation was designed to be proactive, i.e. prevent attacks. Can, can you explain a wee bit about what's going on in Glasgow? Yes, I think although the protocol exists, one of the suggestions I was going to make is that that either gets reissued or you know um, revisited because I think the protocol itself is quite clear on the roles and responsibilities, but yet my experience within Glasgow is that um, the protocol is not being followed in terms of who picks up the investigation. Um, we've had a number of cases referred to as directly by uh, the Procurator Fiscal, where for some reason some th the case has not um, been successful in court, and they've then looked to the local authority uh, to issue a dog control notice. Having spoken directly to some of the uh, Procurator uh, Fiscals that have been involved in the cases, 
it was very evident that they didn't understand what the role of the dog control notice, um, what was actually involved in carrying out an assessment of the dog. They thought it was a case of just writing out a, a notice and that that got handed to the person and that that was the end of it. Um, so I think there was definitely, it came across to me very loud and clear that there was a lack of understanding of the overall process. Um, and I think that some of these, the cases that have been passed to us, it's where um, I've got one case where someone's uh, dog was so badly injured that it's like literally like thousands of pounds of um, cost to the person. That's come to us because the police just said pass it to the local authority. Um, so I think that I think it would definitely help all involved in dealing with the legislation if there was um, sort of further clarity or a reinforcement of the protocol that was perhaps originally agreed. And I don't think it's just an issue for the police. I think it's even for everyone in, that's got a role to play in the kind of, you know, dealing with this legislation. Um, Did I hear you correctly when you said there's a lack of understanding among the fiscals on this? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there, there is a principle in law that good law is clear law. Yeah. And it's been pretty clear to me in the work we've done on this so far that it is a mess. I mean, I think the Dangerous Dogs Act was the, the act itself that was called a dog's breakfast. But when you add on the Control of Dogs Act that was passed by this parliament and was very well-meaning, it seems quite a complicated legislative landscape that is clearly difficult to understand. Is that what I'm hearing from you? Yeah, I think so. I think it's even uh, sometimes there's... Uh, confusion over which is the appropriate route to go down, you know, which piece of legislation to make best use of. So, for example, we were always of the understanding if it was a person that received an injury uh, from a dog that that would normally, if it was a serious injury, that that would normally be taken up from police perspective rather than a dog control notice. However, some in some occasions, those are the types of cases that are being passed to the local authority. And while I appreciate that sometimes a case can go to court and that the outcome may well be that a dog control notice is to be put in place, I understand that, but it, it, it's almost as if that's now being the kind of preferred route maybe to avoid things having to go to court. It's, it's certainly the impression that we're getting within the Glasgow area. I'm not saying that it's necessarily true across the board, but um, it's certainly our experience in Glasgow. Is that ref uh, Linda Gray's testimony, is that reflective of what happens other places as well? I had a slightly different picture from Bill Gilchrist yeah. there, but the other three councils? Uh, similar uh, to yeah. Glasgow. And the Gale and Butte, we've got a good relationship with Police Scotland. Uh, Police Scotland have this uh, dangerous dog standard operating procedure, mm -hmm. which I find a lot of police officers haven't seen. Uh, and then within this document, there is uh, uh, roles and responsibilities for local authorities in the Police Scotland. And it contains a paragraph where it says, if there, are, if there is an insufficiency of evidence or, or the procurator fiscal takes no proceedings, the local authority dog warden will be updated promptly and asked to consider the matter under the terms of the Control of Dogs Scotland Act 2010. Now, that's pretty much what happens most of the time. Uh, and uh, we have a good relationship, but it doesn't always happen that way because a lot of young police officers haven't seen a lot of police, a lot haven't seen this. Uh, we also have inconsistencies across Scotland, where because I'm on the National Dog Warden Association focus group, where there is a an authorised authorised officer. Some are better than others. Some are trained better than others. Uh, and we've long thought should there be some sort of SVQ for authorised officers to get consistency across the board. Uh, an SVQ level two or whatever. But part of the problem we have is a, a variation in authorised officers' abilities and also uh, police officers not being really up to date on dogs. Okay. Thank you very yeah. much, Jim Ferguson. Kay Watson. Yes, the Sorry, I was, I was called Kay first and then Sorry, I'll come to you, back. Alistair. Kay. We have, <clears throat> I w in some ways, I would disagree with how we work in Fife is we have a great relationship with the police. Uh, and in most cases with the police, if they are going to be charging someone under the Dangerous Dogs Act because the dog has quite severely bitten a person, they will also make us aware at that first stage so that we can issue a dog control notice in the meantime, depending on what's going to happen with the courts. So that from the day that that incident happened, that dog is then covered by a control notice, whether it be it has to be muzzled, whether it has to be leaded, or whatever we can do to prevent any further incidents happening whilst the court is wait waiting to make their decision. We actually feel as a council that works quite well because it also makes us aware of cases that might 
otherwise not have been brought to our t attention if it's attack on people and not on dogs. Uh, so I feel quite positive on, on how we work in Fife with the police and as a general rule they do try and make us aware of most cases. Thank you. Alistair Lee. Sorry, um, I was going to say about the national protocol. It actually stipulates who should carry out the initial investigation. It lays down, as uh, Bill's already said, in fairly good detail who should carry out the initial investigation. Once that investigation is completed, if the police have carried out the investigation and can't proceed any further, it still enables them to pass the, the, the case over to the, the local authority for them to pursue under the control of dogs legislation. Um, what we've found is we have suspicion, as Bill's already uh, alluded to, uh, that sometimes the local uh, bobbies um, are not particularly aware of the protocol. They like to refer incidents of attacks over to the local authority without having gone through the complete investigation route. So they refer information over to the local authority without actually providing sufficient evidence and information for the local authority to then pursue and take action under the control of dogs legislation. So what we get is basically a phone call from a local police officer um, with information about a dog attack, no information about the person or the dog that was attacked. Basically all we get is the information um, about the person that owns the dog and then a request for us to go out and investigate. That's insufficient evidence, insufficient information for us to proceed on. So it makes things very difficult. Things have improved slightly uh, in the last six to 12 months, um, but it does still occur. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's really useful. Um, I'm going to bring in Alex Neil, and then we'll come back to this case. <coughs> Just the final point on the protocol. It'd be helpful if we get a copy of the protocol and circulated uh, to us, that if that's be, possible. That would be very helpful. Okay. Yeah. Um, <coughs> one of the issues, I mean, the two themes come out of the panel we had with people who had been victims of dog attacks. One was that, the, 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 you know, who does what, the local authority or the police, and that's very confusing to the public, and to them it looks as though it's past the buck time in too many cases, and clearly that needs to be sorted out. I think we're all agreed on that, and I think you're hinting at that. Uh, but the second point was, very often offenders, people who've been served with a dog control notice, move out of the local authority area where the notice was served, and the information, well, the local authority doesn't always know that they've moved, um, but the information isn't then carried to the next authority. So basically rendering the effectiveness of the dog control notice useless. So clearly with the absence of a national database, um, that makes matters even worse because um, if you had a national database and people were compelled to notify when they moved, if they've got a dog control notice, um, then that may solve it. But how would how do you tackle this issue of somebody who moves out of the area without notifying the local authority, either the one they're leaving or the one they're going to? Uh, and the, the new authority, as it were, has no idea that they've been served with a dog control notice. And even if there's another offence, they still don't know there's a history of offending. How do you solve that? Thank you basis the only way forward to try and avoid that happening. Uh, as it stands at the minute, if someone makes us aware that they're moving out with Fife to, uh, to another region, we would contact a dog warden within that area to make them aware that they're there. Yeah. But if they're not telling us, we have no idea where they are. So that it's, we're completely unable to follow that up. And that same dog can go and re-offend and basically start the whole process at the beginning again yeah. as a first offence. So it's a major flaw in the legislation. It's a major flaw, yeah. It needs to be addressed, obviously. Yeah. Um, just in terms of the national database, presumably, in your view, it's the Scottish Government who should be setting up the national database in cooperation with Police Scotland and COSLAN, the local authorities. Would that, would that be correct? I would agree with that, yeah. yeah. Right. Definitely. Um, and when was the last time the, the, the lack of a national database, to the best of your knowledge, was raised with the Scottish Government? I mean... Has, has, is anybody nagging the Scottish Government to do what they're supposed to do under the terms of the legislation? I would say no to that. Um, we'll change that. Because, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, without a national database, there's a lot of aspects of this that just are going to fall by the wayside. Is that not right? Yeah, I mean, we asked a question back eight and a half years ago about 
is there going to be any additional funding or resources? And we're told there's no plans for any additional funding or resources. So that was that. But it hasn't been revisited since, uh, and the database hasn't been revisited either. So. Which is clearly something we have to raise with the government because they have a role to play in this as well. Uh, Sorry, yeah. I, I, if you don't mind, Chair, just uh, one item you'd spoken about about the national database. Clearly, we have other other avenues of information available to local authorities, which, if they were able to be accessed in terms of the dog uh, dog control legislation, these might actually have some benefit. I'm um, thinking particularly of electoral role and council tax registers, because when a member of the public moves to another local authority, they may well um, put their name in an electoral role, which is updated monthly now. Um, they may well have a liability for council tax. And that sort of information might provide some sort of correlation to a name in a database, a national database for dog control, in which case it, there may be a pointer for the local authority into whose area they have moved to take action and to allow the initial issuing local authority to pass information on. So if we can have that, that interplay between these bodies of information, that may be some assistance. The thing that doesn't change, obviously, is the microchip number of the dog. That's right. And, and but that, at, the, that, at the problem, we have a number of, a number of uh, pet ID databases. Uh, there's no requirement for the person who has to get their dog microchipped to put that um, ID number on a particular database. Yeah. Whereas if we had a national database where all dogs were registered, because I think certainly from a practical point of view of, um, from our investigations, finding out which database the person has actually had the dog microchipped onto, even in its own, provides yeah. a problem. Yeah. If, I, if you go into a different topic there, slightly? See, well, well, slightly, but still, I think, relevant to the national database. OK, if you can just finish national yeah, database, sorry. then I'm going to bring in Mr Coffey, and yeah. then I'll come back to you. OK. The, and, and that is the distinction between the owner and the person in charge of the dog at the time of the offence. Now, at the moment, the, the law really goes for the owner. Um, uh, rather than the person in charge of the dog, but it, but sometimes it's unclear about who actually is responsible. So you might have a responsible owner get somebody to walk the dog, and the person walking the dog is deliberately, you know, stirring things up with the animal, or um, it might be the owner's fault. It seems to me that another part of the legislation that needs to be strengthened is to make both the owner and whoever's in charge of the dog at the time of any offence both liable for prosecution. Would that be would that be right? I think that would be valuable because, as has been has been highlighted in some of the papers, we do have the situation where you have professional dog walkers yeah. who are maybe walking five or six animals at a time. Um, they have to have some measure of responsibility for the dog's behaviour during the time where it's under their control or lack thereof. Yeah. Um, so I would certainly think that that's a very valid point. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Billy Coffee. Thank you very much, convener. Good morning again to everybody. Um, uh, the, the Act's purpose was to try to identify out-of-control dogs at an early stage and provide measures to change their behaviour before they become dangerous. Mm. Just for the record, would you say that's whether that's been successful or not in your experience? I think that's <clears throat> one of the strongest uh, parts of the legislation, is that we see ourselves as being the people who will prevent injury to children or adults. Uh, and the, the Control of the Dogs Act, when it was introduced, there was definitely a place for it. Uh, Police Scotland had so many cases where the Dangerous, dog, the Dangerous Dogs Act, it just wasn't, the case just wasn't, it, it wasn't good enough to be prosecuted. And Police Scotland didn't have a lot of options open to them then. And the Control of the Dogs Act was ideal because it flagged up to us situations where irresponsible dog ownership was causing potential potential to cause harm and we could step in and whether that's coaching the dog owner, training the dog owner, supporting the dog owner, you know, and some, some dog owners are glad to see you because some of them are coping very well with their dog. Uh, so yeah, the Control of the Dog Act has certainly been excellent for prevention uh, and if we have to serve a dog control notice then so be it. And even when we serve a dog control notice we'll still be there to monitor it and to help the, the dog owner as much as we can. So it's a certainly a very useful piece of legislation that just needs tidied up a bit. What about other views? From Glasgow's perspective, that usually um, the 
um, cases, if you like, or whether it be requests for us to get involved in anything, usually come after there's been some kind of incident. So from our point of view, um, whether that's because of a lack of resource maybe being out and about, I know that some of the authorities were saying they monitor areas, you know, they've got dog wardens that are actively out um, and maybe pick up on like behaviour of dogs that they see out and about. Um, but for us, ours is very much kind of reacting to requests that come to us and the majority of those have been following on from some kind of incident. Some of them have been where the person, we've got a, a small number where people have kind of just raised concerns with us at the behaviour of a dog, but there hasn't been like a bite or anything. It's just the felt that the dog's been quite aggressive in its um, sort of mannerisms and everything when they've been around and that they've expressed a concern, maybe that there's other children in the area or, you know, things like that. But I would have to say in the cases that we've investigated, that would be the minority of cases and it's usually followed mm -hmm. an incident. So, as I say, I don't know where Glasgow sometimes is a wee bit of an anomaly, so it's maybe different in some of the other areas. We certainly encourage Police Scotland to uh, inform us uh, anything, even if it doesn't fall under Dangerous Dogs Act, and even if it's minor, to inform us anyway and we'll investigate it because that little thing could become a big thing. You know, that could be that could be the start of something and we have to make sure that we're dealing with it and nothing nothing comes. Yes, well, I think I think that's fair comment. We would all like to and we do get reports from the police and from the public where there has been an incident where a dog has been very aggressive or challenging towards another dog or a, to a person uh, and placing them into a state of fear and alarm. And at that point, we would want to step in and, as has already been said, try to change the behaviour of the dog, recognise the behaviour of the dog and provide training and advice to the owners. So, yes, yeah, I think it's in everybody's best interest to get, get the local authority involved through the, the control of dogs uh, legislation at a very early stage rather than as a result of the incident. But I would certainly concur with what Linda says. In the vast majority of the cases, we get involved as the result of an incident being reported to us. OK, Alistair. It, is, it has been effective, but it, it is, by its very nature, it is a reactive piece of legislation. Um, so, yes, we do get involved basically after an incident has occurred. Um, it may well be that it's not a, a major incident. It may be a minor incident that's occurred which allows us to step in and mitigate things and actually prevent uh, a, a possible future um, major incident, major attack. Uh, but it is, by its very nature, it is a reactive piece of legislation. OK, lastly. I completely agree. We are almost completely a reactive service. We can only respond to complaints that are coming in from members of the public unless we actually see dogs not being kept under control whilst we're out and about. Uh, but I also agree that the, the, the legislation has been successful in the fact that we can possibly get in involved at the stage of where a dog has chased another dog. Getting involved at that stage then stops that, may possibly stop that dog going on to kill another dog. Uh, so I do believe from that aspect that the, the, the legislation has been a success that we can get involved at early doors and try and prevent anything more serious happening. So what, what about um, looking at potential measures that might intervene before attacks occur. I think from what you've said, it's more, it's more of a useful tool, the Act, in dealing with incidents after they've occurred. And we had a wee look across some other jurisdictions to see if there's any evidence or anything that tells us what measures they deploy to try to prevent dog attacks before they occur. And we haven't been particularly <laughs> successful in, in finding that, apart from an example that was given to us in Canada and Calgary where their statistics and the actions that they have taken in terms of licensing and providing training for dogs and owners seems to have had a successful impact in reducing the number of dog bites over a period of years. So wh what experience could you share with us or suggestions could you, could you offer us that might intervene even before the dog attacks occur? Sure, we work very closely with the Dogs Trust um, and we have had a number of initiatives over the past, I would say, three years or so, where we have offered free microchipping of dogs to members of the community uh, and the officers within my team have taken the opportunity to attend these sessions and provide advice on the existence of the dog control legislation and to highlight to dog owners um, the, you know, the, the scope of the legislation how we would expect them to, to control their dog and, and make sure that their animal behaves well. So we do work closely with other organisations to try to highlight the existence of the legislation. Um, but that's, that's really about as much as we have done at the moment, to be honest. 
having any success though, in terms of reported attacks, Bill? Um, we, we really, as I said in my submission, we, we haven't really been able to establish a sort of long-term trend of reports to us. Um, what I would say is that, that um, when we do get um, reports to us, the, uh, the people who are reporting incidents to us are aware of the legislation and in a few instances, but I would say it is only a few, they have attended a microchipping event and spoken to my officers and become aware of the legislation at that time. So um, maybe a greater public publicity, publicity surrounding the existence of the Act may, may be of some use. We, we try our best to look at Unfortunate incidents that happen and look to see where we can learn or other people can learn. And we had one last summer, it was a, an ale festival near Inverary. And uh, chap took his dog onto the stage and uh, an ale festival and dogs, you know, and uh, loud music, people dancing, and the dog disfigured a five year old girl. Uh, police never took any action, which was odd, but. And uh, the parent, the irate parent, came to the council to see what we were going to do, and we hadn't been informed. But once we had gone down the road of the process, once we did get informed, we revamped our events pack. So all our events in Argyll and Butte now will figure in dogs and the control of dogs and responsible behaviour when you're at events. Uh, that might lead to people leaving dogs in cars. So we've covered that as well. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're, there's lessons to be learned from these type of situations where you have crowded places, people with dogs, dogs get a bit scared. So there's lessons for everybody there. Unfortunate for the five-year-old girl, but uh, we've, we've certainly re revamped our events paperwork. Yeah, yeah. Any others have views about how we can intervene earlier, even before the attacks? I think one of the things that could also perhaps um, we were certainly looking at is working along with even like our kind of uh, parks uh, department in terms of sort of doing responsible ownership sort of little like, I mean mini roadshow type thing you know so that um, is similar to what you've perhaps mm -hmm. described where you might look at the microchipping but it was also perhaps making people aware of their responsibilities even in terms of the legislation as well because. I'm not sure that everyone is fully aware, you know, of even as a dog owner, what their role and responsibilities are. Um, so again, I guess promoting the legislation as well as offering support and guidance um, rather than having to tackle people by using the legislation would perhaps help in some cases. You're still always going to get some irresponsible dog owners that are not interested, but I think even if we could reach even more of the people that are just unaware then that might still help um, reduce some of the incidents. Okay, okay. Alistair? Uh, do roadshow road events where they go to the public parks uh, throughout the area, basically same as Bill's, um, microchipping. Um, we used to do free microchipping events. Um, that's basically fallen by the wayside slightly now, uh, basically because the Dogs Trust have started to do free microchipping anyway, so the Dogs Trust are involved. Uh, they have a, a they probably have a part to play, um, basically uh, dealing with the owners as well. It's not just the local authorities. Uh, Dogs Trust, I would suggest, probably have a, a quite a big input um, into um, dealing with the owners, educating the owners. Um, people have a problem with the dog. They don't tend to come to the local authority. They, they tend to go to uh, either a pet behaviourist if they can find one, or to uh, PDSA or one of the one of the animal charities. So I would suggest maybe they could have a, an input into this. Mm -hmm. okay. I think just what everybody else has covered, we've previously done things like free microchipping. We do school visits, try and educate children on how to behave around dogs and what they would, should do if dogs approach, etc. Uh, we do various events. So, for example, the SSPC are having an event in Fife this month, which we are also going to attend and put up a stall for education. Uh, and also we're doing free microchipping there as well in the bids to try and speak to as many dog owners as possible. The downside is, is the people that tend to go to these events are normally your responsible dog owners. So I, I would be happily open to any suggestions that can target that group of dog owners that are the biggest issue. Uh, but as of yet, we've not found anything successful. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Everybody. you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Willie. Jim Ferguson, really concerned about the the incident you described with the five-year-old girl on a stage, you said she'd been disfigured. Is that permanently? Permanently, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
I'm concerned about police reaction in this case because if a human being had permanently disfigured a five-year-old girl on the stage, there would be no doubt that there would be a charge of assault, at least. Yeah, was what was the police's reasoning for not bringing any action here? We had this phone call to our call centre from the upset parent, and it was two weeks after. And we searched and searched and searched and thought, we don't have this case. We don't have it. Surely we must, we must have something. We must have been notified of something. And it was the police call, the police, call, the police call centre in government that had pointed the lady in our direction. And we were like, oh, can't find anything. And we had to go back to her and say, we don't have this on file at all. And I met with the police inspector and I said, do you know anything about this? And he asked his officers, could you investigate? Did we have any cases from that event? And uh, a young police officer had uh, been involved in this and had actually, taken the, had actually driven the child 25 miles to the hospital. Uh, but there was no action taken under the Dangerous Dogs Act. So was reasoning for no, that no action being taken? He apologised. Uh, he met with the child's mother. It was quite clearly a failing on the part of the police and highlights the inconsistencies that you do get. As well as authorised officers and local authorities, you get inconsistencies. And uh, obviously we had to start uh, working on the case and we spoke to the organisers of the event, who are quite a large company, uh, and they helped us. And then they spoke to the stewards, and the stewards had been aware of the incident, but had, and had actually asked the, asked the chap to leave the event. Now, the chap had left in a car, and one of the stewards had re remembered the car's registration number. This is the dog owner. The dog owner. Mm. And uh, the car registration number was traced to, but coincidentally, K. Watson's area, uh, and we passed it over to K. Watson uh, to take over. But there was still no charge under the Dangerous Dogs Act, which was baffling, but there's, to this, there was never a charge for Dangerous Dogs Act. But we said, this can't, this can't happen again. This can't happen. People going to events, ale festivals, music events, taking their dog, summertime. This doesn't, doesn't work. Do you agree with me that if that assault had been carried out by... Uh, a man or a woman, that there would definitely have been charges brought. Absolutely, and it brings me back to this Police Scotland document. Yep. That quite clearly, it's in black and white, and it has the rules and responsibilities. It covers everything. It's a good document. It doesn't pass the buck to the local authority. It's very balanced, uh, but it's not that well known in Police I mean, Scotland. I think your story there is, well, it's extremely upsetting and worrying, but there's a huge issue of child safety here. We've already heard evidence, I think, from doctors a couple of weeks ago that dogs will go for children because of the height and size of children. So there's a huge issue of child safety here. I'm trying to visualise the, the dance floor with people who have been drinking and the height of the child and the height of the dog with a very similar height uh, and the role of the stewarding of the event and what they were thinking about, you know. So there's a, there's a lot of questions to be answered, but we've certainly took robust action uh, from our point of view, uh, okay. and especially in event management. So. Thank you, Jim Ferguson. Do members have anything on that point specifically? I have a wider question I want to pursue and ask Sarwar the point about the story we've just heard. Jim, I can see you're, you're um, physically emotional that you're telling that story, so, so thank, you, thank you for sharing it for, in terms of the work of the committee. Um, so one's about the responsibility of uh, the individual and, and that getting passed on and, and the failure of the police, and that's perhaps something we can take up with, with the next panel. But do you think the law should also look at the, the organisers of, of any such event and the responsibility that they have uh, in terms of safety, uh, liability, um, in terms of their own events and the, and the impact of what happens there? I mean, the idea that there was a dog and a five-year-old on a dance floor with loud music sounds ridiculous in itself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, our licence and standards officer is a ex-Police Scotland superintendent, so obviously he oversees the licensing of such events. And with his background, you know, we were able to get this new procedure together, make it robust, and uh, make sure none of that happens, happens again. Uh, but yeah, the organisers, the, or the organisers contacted the child's mother. Uh, they apologised. I don't know what, if anything else came of it, but they apologised to the child's mother. But we, we passed the details of the child's mother to the organisers. At first, the organisers were not cooperating. They, they, weren't, they weren't cooperating at first. 
that was the, the first the first week or two they were not cooperating. They were in denial. Well, at any point did the organisers break the law? No. In, in terms of allowing that situation even to the take place? The organisers' opinion was it's nothing to do with us. It wasn't our dog. It was a chap that came on with his dog. We can't stop that. Um, we have no we have no jurisdiction over dogs and children and who does what at these events. And I, I totally disagree with that. Yeah. So that, they have no choice now. We thought, if that's if that's the grey area that we've got, let's get it closed. Let's get it closed. It's closed now. And is so, that now closed across all local authorities? It won't be. No, it won't be. I think that's something that we need to address as well. Bill Bowman. Thank you, Convener. I have a couple of areas I'd like to ask some questions on. The first one we've, I think, um, discussed in a little bit of detail, which is the Scottish Dogs Control Database. Um, and in evidence, um, we've been told that not having a database was, quote, a big miss in, in this act. And I think it was interesting what um, Jim Ferguson said, mentioned technicalities, which so far anyway in the evidence we haven't, we haven't heard of as, as, a, as a reason. But just... Um, briefly on this particular area, can, can I take it that all of you and all of your local authorities would support a database? Yes. I mean, the concept of a, a database, okay. Right, so I'll, I'll leave that one there and move on to a, a different topic. And, um, you know, we've heard that not all local authorities have appointed officers who have an understanding of dog behaviour and dog control issues um, to enforce the Act. In some instances, it was dog control duties have been added to the remits of environmental health officers, community wardens, pest control officers. So can you tell us the steps in your local authorities that you've taken to ensure that the people who have been appointed have the skills and knowledge to carry out these duties? The National Dog Warden Association hold two training seminars a year, one in May and one in October. The primary function is that Practically every, every local authority pays a membership fee to the National Dog Warden Association and that money goes towards training. And uh, last year we got the Crown, o Crown Office Property, Property Fiscal Service to come along because uh, we, we could see a need where dog control notice breaches. A lot of, do a lot of dog wardens say, oh, what's the point? Uh, Property of Fiscal Service, they don't bother. Dogs, they're not interested. But the Property of Fiscal is quite clear that that's not the case. And, uh, and a lot, of, a lot of the submissions they get from local authorities is of very poor quality, and you'd have some difficulty getting that through a sheriff court. So the fiscal service came along and did a training day at the uh, seminar on evidence and what you need to get something through court. And again, that, that covers the, what we're talking about, the inconsistency of authorised officers and local authorities, their skills and abilities and people People who were doing another role now doing a new role in dogs and maybe not had the training. But are you saying then that your people have all had training? My people have all had training as far as the National Dog Warden Association goes, and that's been my training. And working with people that have been dog control officers for 30 years or so, mm -hmm. what I call the traditional dog control officers, there's very few left, because uh, there was a time where that was a specialist area, and that's what the person did. And I think Kay, Kay is still in that sort of realm, but it's, it's rare now, it's quite rare now. Uh, we would be the pest control, environmental enforcement, fly tipping, uh, litter fines, uh, and also the dog control officers. So it's a lot to learn, but this is why I think to get some uniformity, standardisation across Scotland, we need some sort of SVQ. We need something. Your authority, you are appointing people who have the skills and the training. I believe that we have people who have the appropriate skills and training. But I do not believe that's consistent across the country. Well, maybe hear from the others then. OK, Glasgow doesn't um, come up very um, favourably in terms of um, the number of officers that carry out this function. And one of the things we realised that is, as I said earlier, I feel as if this is quite a specialist role because you do have to have the experience and the skills that are necessary in dealing with the dogs that... Um, as a result of that, we looked to get um, some training put in place by Elaine Henley, and I think she was involved at the outset of the kind of legislation coming in. She was part of like um, some of the experts involved in it. We had looked at getting her to come and do some training uh, with staff. However, there were some issues raised about did the staff, the staff, um, the existing staff that carried out enforcement functions, did they have? Um, 
already the experience that would then even lend itself to getting the appropriate training, etc. Um, so because of a number of concerns that were raised, we have now got an interim measure in place where we have uh, a secondment from a member of staff that carries out this kind of role in another local authority to help us in the meantime while we uh, come up with a more permanent solution to the training and the experience necessary for carrying out the function. Um, I think, um, obviously, I saw some of the comments from the previous meeting where it was clear that um, Glasgow was being highlighted perhaps as not issuing um, the same volume of dog control notices as some of the other authorities, in particular um, Kay's authority. So when you looked at the size of the local authorities, it was probably quite puzzling as to why there was such a discrepancy. Um, but since we've had this interim measure in place, um, we've turned around the volume of investigations taking place and indeed dog control notices being issued. But we are looking to get a more permanent uh, solution to that within Glasgow. In East Ayrshire, the, um, the investigation and issue of dog control notices is done by environmental health officers within my team. They have the necessary um, skills in relation to investigation techniques, um, evidence gathering, statement taking. They've also had uh, training from Elaine Henley as well. They had a two-day training course. Uh, day one was a classroom-based session. Uh, on the legislation and you know animal characteristics and behaviours, the second day was actually a practical training session involving their, and you know, um, interacting with dogs which had different uh, behavioural characteristics and could show signs of aggression, and they were taught how to recognise these signs and to deal with them. We have two pest control officers, stroke dog wardens, who also have had training in handling aggressive dogs and have the necessary equipment to do so. Not everyone has to answer. If you feel the general position of your council has already been covered, then please well, don't feel... I'd like feel to hear that they all actually have... They can confirm that. I just mean don't need to go into a lot of detail if you don't want to. Kay Watson. I think we are exceptionally lucky at Fife Council. We have two full-time dedicated dog wardens. Uh, and it's a role that we went into because it's something that we're interested in. Uh, coming from dog backgrounds previously and then carrying on our training within the role. So I think as a council, we are exceptionally lucky to have that. Uh, and I do believe that shows in a lot of our figures uh, because we do have those dedicated officers. Uh, similarly, in North Lanarkshire, we're very well placed. We have three full-time equivalent dog wardens. Uh, they all came from an animal welfare background. They all came from animal welfare charities dealing with dangerous dogs, dogs with behavioural problems. So they have no problems whatsoever dealing with any of these dogs that they come across. Thank you. Goes sort of work in progress. Um, I think as well, Elaine Henley did a lot of training with all the local authorities when the legislation was first introduced. But I think just as is the way with local authorities, the turnover even of staff and things means that some of the people that maybe originally had training are no longer carrying out that particular function as well. But yes, we're very much a work in progress. Jim? Yeah, well, I've met Elaine Henley. She's from the Association of Pet Behaviourists and... Uh, we have uh, had our in to train some of our, our wardens, but we are a, we are a multidisciplined service. We, there's nine of us, soon to be four, and we, we have uh, multiple roles to, to... But we are as trained as we can be. And I always think about the pest control side of things, where pest control was very robust training. Continuous personal development, you have to go and, you know, have to renew your licence. We need something that's a bit more robust for the dogs. We, we, North Lanarkshire has, seems to have a good situation there. Fife has a good situation. But it's not across the board. Mm. I think we're good at what we do. I think we're good at what we do, but we've had to kind of get there ourselves. So. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Very briefly. I mean, I hear what you say, but but Alistair in North Lanarkshire, uh, <coughs> you've issued a total, and in, in the seven years the legislation has been going, you've issued a total of eleven. Well, according to the statistics we have... Oh, which statistics is, are out of date, then I'm afraid we've issued 28 uh, right. DCS. So, so this is up to 2017-18, uh, and it says 11, even 18. I mean, Orkney has issued more than you uh, in the seven years. And similarly with Glasgow, Glasgow is a total of three over the seven years, and the figures aren't available for the last two years. So, um, how is, I mean, it's good that you've got three dog wardens, mm -hmm. but... You know, uh, even even eighteen, uh, presumably they're, they're you know in recent times, are they? 
28, but I wouldn't use the number of dog control notices issued as being a good marker, to be quite honest with you. Uh, they get involved with investigations. They will give verbal advice. They will give written warnings, which don't actually come under the... the so, so how do we judge success, then? I would say by the number of dog attacks that don't happen. Well, that's, nobody records that. Nobody no, knows that. That's, that's the problem. a better measure than that. That is the problem. Attacks in Scotland are rising. Aye. And if you so, look, at, look at A and E admissions, uh, even in Lanarkshire, it's five thousand uh, across. That's right, yeah. exactly. I mean that 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 would indicate there's a big problem out there. So we need if if dog control notices aren't a measure of success, we need a better measure of success. But not the number of dog attacks that don't happen. You can't measure that. No, that is the problem. So what should the measure of success be? I'm not in a position to say. Linda. Uh, first of all, if I can clarify just the figures from Glasgow now to give you more up to date. Yeah. We've issued nine dog control notices within the past 14 months. Um, again, partly due to the interim measure that we put in place by getting someone that was uh, suitably experienced, etc. Um, we've investigated 100 different reports to us, all at various stages. Some of those include cases referred by the police and the procurator fiscal. Other ones are just from members of the public. So we've now in the past, and I'm just talking about in the past 14 months, that's been 100 cases that we've investigated, resulting in nine dog control notices. However, I can see that it, whether it's a measure of that people now realise that we're taking forward the legislation, we're, it's an increasing number of reports or requests that we're getting through to look into this. So I'm not sure, um, I would agree in terms of dog control notices are only one measure in terms of the legislation. Um, and the dog control notice sometimes relies on there being sufficient information to allow you to put that in place, which is not always there when you're investigating right. the matter. So I don't know that that's necessarily um, given the full picture of okay. what works carried so out. I think it's an issue. How do we measure success? Yeah. Um, right. I, th I think it's very difficult. I suppose, from my point of view, a decrease in the number of reports would perhaps be a measure, but given that I think there's not enough um, awareness even necessarily within the public, within the, the agencies involved necessarily in dealing with the legislation, um, I'm not sure that a decrease would necessarily reflect that it's an improvement in the situation because I think the more people are aware, the more they will perhaps report. So it may show a rise in the number of incidents being reported, but not necessarily the number of incidents that have been taking place for a period of time. I heard a so, story from Jim... Ferguson, where there was no yeah. police report yeah. or prosecution in a really serious case. Yeah. This issue of dog control notices, when we took this issue out to the public, in the three public meetings we did across the country, um, a really strong theme coming back was that dog control, people had reported either attacks on their children or dog on dog attacks to the council. They think a dog control notice had been issued. They weren't sure. Because what they were hearing back from the council is data protection doesn't allow you as council officers to tell the person whose dog or child was attacked what controls have been put in place. So let me give you an example. There was one couple in Dundee whose dog had been seriously attacked by another dog. I think its ear was hanging off and... Um, this dog who'd attacked it lived around the corner, but they kept seeing it when they were out walking their dog and it was off the leash and it wasn't muzzled and it was just kind of roaming free. And they had no way to know what restrictions had been put on this dog and what the owner had been asked to do. Is that a reasonable situation for the public to be in? case in East Ayrshire, we would, we would always provide a list of conditions attached to a dog, a dog control notice to the complainant in the first instance. I think the issue arises is where you actually identify the recipient of the notice to the complainant. We would not do that. We would, however, say that in relation to an attack on your dog at such and such a date, at such and such a time, a dog, a dog control notice has been imposed imposing the following conditions. And it's, the, ol the only um, f data protection issue would arise is where you actually identify the recipient of the notice. And we would either redact the notice or simply provide a list of conditions which were attached to a notice issued in relation to that attack. OK, Bill, let me try and unpick that a bit, because what we've heard from the public 
is that dog wardens have said to people who's, who have been attacked that they can't tell them anything about the conditions of the dog control notice because of data protection. So are you saying that that's a very wide reading of data protection and actually you can inform people who have suffered a dog attack of the restrictions of the dog control notice? That's precisely what we're saying. Okay. Yeah, we, we would adopt that stance as well with the GDPR. Uh, we had one situation on an island where... Sorry, you would adopt which stance, the, Jim? That the you G couldn't say the, anything yeah, or yeah, you can share information? We can't, we can't say anything. We can't pass that information to the complainer. You can't pass any information no, to a complainer? No, okay. data protection reasons. So how yeah. come Bill Gilchrist isn't under those data protection reasons? Well, we, we are acting under the data protection regulations. Yeah. However, the data protection regulations, as we interpret it, allow us to provide information, providing we do not identify an individual within that information. So we can say we have, we have served a dog control notice. We don't say on whom. We simply say we have served a dog control notice yeah. and these are the conditions which we would apply, which we have applied. And we would do that in the form of a letter rather uh -huh. than issue a redacted copy of the notice. Okay. So you're just saying you don't put the dog owner's name yeah, don't on Jimmy it, Smith but of obviously such the yes. person who's dog attacked, yeah. if it lives around the corner, they're going to know, but Maybe. the law doesn't allow you to identify mm. them, which is fair enough, but yes. they get the list of restrictions on them. Yes. So they can monitor themselves, actually, what's well, going I think, on. Well, I think that provides very valuable information to the council in case in the case of another incident, but it also provides a reasonable measure of assurance to the person who's been the victim of the attack in the first place. Yeah. And I, don't, I don't think, for, in, a, in terms of natural justice, that's unreasonable. I mean, to be honest, that's what I would have assumed would mm. be the sensible outcome. So are we getting here that other local authorities are taking a very broad reading of this data protection and just not issuing any information at all? I think it depends on how the data protection regulations are interpreted by their legal services section or their freedom of information officer. Gosh, so we've got a mixed picture right across the country. Do, do yes. any of the rest you want to... Shed some light on that. I think we would um, just share with the person the fact that we were investigating the incident that they've passed the information about. We would say, you know, that um, and that that could potentially lead. We would go through what the potential outcomes of that would be, including um, a dog control notice, and explain to them what types of things would be considered within that dog control notice, but not actually saying that's what we've issued to. A particular person so we could say to them we're investigating your complaint and we'll take whatever action is appropriate given the you know the investigation what that kind of brings out and um, but I agree that that's it's still not a very satisfactory outcome for someone who's perhaps been subject to um, whether it be um, an attack or their dogs being attacked or something you know it's it's um, not okay. ideal, so but I do feel as if we're very limited in the information that we yeah. can share. Okay, so we have different interpretations by different council legal service about information to be shared. I think that's something that we need to clear up as well. Let me ask you one more thing on the dog control notice. We had evidence from uh, a woman whose daughter suffered severe disfigurement by a dog. It was back in 2010. It was at the start of this legislation, but her understanding was that that dog was under a dog control notice. What do you all do about really irresponsible owners who you have put a dog control notice on, but who just blatantly ignore it? I think this is where we're finding a big problem is that when a dog control notice is breached, there's two separate issues is one, we can't change a dog control notice uh, without the owner's permission. So, for example, there may not be enough evidence to actually put a breach case to the procurator fiscal, but we ha have enough evidence to believe that they're failing to adhere to their dog control notice. I can't go and change a dog control notice to say, right, your dog now has to be muzzled because I don't believe you're keeping it under proper control. I can't do that without their permission, which I think is ridiculous. The owner's... Mm -hmm. The owner of the dog, I have to obtain their permission to change the dog control notice. Mm -hmm. The only other option that's available to me is to remove that dog control notice and issue a new dog control notice. But if I'm issuing a new dog control notice, I, I need to have enough evidence to support that I'm issuing that correctly in case they appeal it. Whereas if it, an option was available to me to change a control notice, then I can put further measures in place there and then. Yeah. The second set of issues is when we do, as Fife Council, as, as generally, when we do send it to the Procurator Fiscal's Office, it can take nine months to a year for that case to be heard. And we're finding more often than not that our cases just aren't heard, they're just dropped. 
Dropped um, by the Crown? Dropped by the Crown, yeah. They'll usually set a date for the case and whether the person doesn't turn up or pleads not guilty, it's, it's not carried further, for that's any further forward. prosecutions under Dangerous Dogs Act? No, that's under no. Uh, Control the Dog Scotland Act. Right, OK. OK. Any further quick points on that, Linda? And it's probably because we've only issued a kind of limited number of dog control notices, but the ones that we have issued, um, we do regular monitoring of them, which again is something that kind of varies what that actually means to, um, you know, across the board. Um, we monitor on the basis of the detail of the dog control notice, what the incident was that's kind of led to it, um, and other circumstances. But the ones that we have issued to date, have all, the people at this point in time have all been in compliance with. Um, but as I say, we've only issued nine. So it's whether that's um, a measure of what it will be like when it increases, I'm not really sure. Um, and probably because we were able to um, give it more dedicated attention. Thank you. So, Super, thank you. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Very briefly, if I may, I'll direct first question direct to you, Linda Gray. Um, we've had some evidence that suggests that the legislation would be improved if there was an offence of obstruction. Uh, what would that look like, in your view, and what would it allow the local authority or, or indeed the courts to do? I think the reason that we included that within our submission was that we've had a couple of instances where we've been trying to um, investigate a matter and we were at the point where we were going to issue a dog control notice and the person had, I think, been living with their parent and then we went to issue the dog control notice and the person, at, the owner of the dog and the dog were no longer present um, and the person just said they've just moved away, they wouldn't give us any details and we have no power to force that information. I mean, we can... Um, and I think we actually, on one occasion, had tried working along with our colleagues in the police to see if that would even encourage any sharing of the information. But um, So we found ourselves in a position where we had a case where a dog control notice would have been issued, but we were unable to do it because the person moved and we were unable to trace them. So there was no comeback for that person just refusing to give us any information. So um, because of um, my background, even um, within enforcement with other legislation, quite often legislation does have a, a charge of obstruction, which you can then remind people that, you know, should they fail to provide you with the information, there'll be repercussions in that, whereas as okay. it stands at the moment, there's nothing. That's, that's very useful, thank you. Final question, I'll direct to Bill Gilchrist at uh, East Ayrshire. You talk about a fixed penalty notice uh, being of interest. Can you just tell us a bit about that, please? Well, certainly my, my team, we deal with the statutory and nuisance provisions of the Environmental Protection Act 1990, and we have the ability to serve uh, fixed penalty notices in the event that an abatement notice is breached. And we've found that to be a highly effective tool in securing compliance with a notice. Um, if there is a financial penalty involved, um, it's, uh, we find it's far more effective than, as has already said, submit a report to the Procurator Fiscal, which, generally speaking, in our uh, um, experience, would be taken. However, there are, uh, there's a huge burden in the court system at the moment. Just to clarify, Bill Gilchrist, uh, so let, there's a breach of a dog control notice, yes. as far as you're aware. Yeah. Uh, you would then have the power to serve a £100 fixed penalty notice and say, you breached that, you owe us £100. Is that right? I think it should be an option. I don't think it should be a, on, the only option available to us. I think, given the circumstances of the breach of the dog control notice, the option should still be there for the local authority to refer the matter to the fiscal, particularly if there's injury to a person or animal. Um, however, if it's, if it's a minor breach of the notice, for example, failing to have the dog muzzled on a particular occasion, a lack of secure fencing around the garden so the dog can escape, I think in those instances a fixed penalty notice would provide a much more effective remedy than a referral to the fiscal which may not go anywhere anyway. Very useful, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much indeed for your evidence this morning. It's been a long session. I appreciate you all um, you know, being very open and honest with us about the situation in each of your local authorities. So thank you very much indeed. I'm going to suspend the committee meeting for a changeover of witnesses until 10.22. Thank you.
Item number two is Post-Legislative Scrutiny Control of Dogs Scotland Act 2010. And I'd like to welcome our second panel of witnesses to the committee's meeting this morning. Alan Murray, Chief Superintendent, and John McCaig, uh, Sergeant, Local Policing and Development Support, both from Police Scotland. You're very welcome. Anthony McGeehan, Head of Policy from the Crown Office, and Fraser Gibson, Procurator Fiscal, South Strathclyde, Dumfries and Galloway, and you are both from Crown Office and the Procurator Fiscal Service. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. Um, Mr Neil, you were going to kick off questioning on the second panel. Are you ready? Yeah, can I first of all start with the point that was raised in the latter part of the previous evidence session about the number of cases dropped by the Procurator Fiscal Service before they get to court and uh, how many of these cases do we know are dropped and why does it take nine months between being reported to the Procurator Fiscal Service before any action is taken? I'll take that question. In answering that question, I think it's important that we understand the framework within which the prosecutorial decision-making takes place. So that framework in Scots law is that the prosecutor, when receiving a case, must consider three essential elements. The first is that the report discloses a crime known to the law of Scotland. The second is that there is sufficient evidence in relation to each of the essential elements of that offence. And finally, the prosecutor must make an assessment as to whether or not it is in the public interest to initiate a prosecution or take alternative prosecutorial action. One of the key points to highlight within that three-step test is that in relation to sufficiency, in Scotland there is a requirement for corroboration in relation to each of the essential elements of an offence. So we need ev evidence from at least two sources in relation to each essential element of that offence. So that's the framework that applies to all reports received by COPFS and it's a framework that applies in relation to relevant offences reported under both the 2010 Act and the 1991 Act. So with that understanding, I can describe some relevant statistics and what those relevant statistics might tell us in relation to some of the evidence that the committee has heard over the course of not only today's evidence session, but previous evidence sessions. And I can go through that if that would be a benefit. I think we certainly, it depends how detailed it is, but I mean, clearly, I think the two things we need to get to the bottom of. Now, I hear what you're saying about the criteria that needs to be met, um, but why, why are, how, how many cases are actually dropped before they go anywhere in terms of prosecution, and why does it take nine months or longer before a decision is taken? Well, again, Ed, Perhaps I misheard this morning's evidence, but I didn't hear that it took nine months uh, before a decision was made. Well, one and of the witnesses said that. I think what one of the witnesses was, was describing uh, was a situation whereby her understanding was that it took time, nine months for cases to be dropped, proceedings having been initiated. And my understanding of the evidence that's available to the committee um, is that that evidence is not supported by the available statistics. If you look at the number of persons prosecuted, versus the number of persons convicted. Right. I think it would be useful then if we got, and I know this might not be readily available, but if we got the figures, say for the last three or four years, of the number of uh, uh, allegations reported to the Procurator Fiscal, how many of these, we, we know we've got the figures and how many um, were resulted in uh, prosecutions, and then it's roughly two-thirds of those, um, according to this, is roughly two-thirds under the Control of Dogs Act, roughly, uh, sorry, under the Dangerous Dogs Act, roughly two-thirds of those prosecuted ended in a conviction, uh, which I would have thought is a reasonable rate. Uh, and it's a higher rate under the Control of Dogs Act. But if you look at the number prosecuted under the Control of Dogs Act, for the first two years of the legislation, there were none. Then it was 4, 4, 11, 7, 10, and 10. Now, to be fair, a very high percentage of those, almost 90% of those ended the conviction, but these are very low numbers for the whole of Scotland. Well, um, those, are the, those are the statistics that I was referring to when considering the evidence that the committee heard in the latter portion of this morning's session, whereby what was described 
was a series of cases that were initiated by the Procurator Fiscal, took approximately nine months to reach a conclusion, and that prior to that conclusion, uh, for reasons unknown to the witness, the case was brought to an end. And those statistics, I would suggest, are not consistent with that evidence. Right. Those statistics are consistent with where a prosecution is initiated by COPFS in relation to contravention of Section 5, there is a high conviction rate. I think one of the areas of interest that the committee may have is in relation to what happens to charges, not accused persons, charges reported to COPFS, and the prosecutorial decision-making in relation to those charges. And I would suggest the committee must understand that the data in relation to persons convicted um, and persons prosecuted is different from the available data in relation to the number of charges reported to COPFS. Right. Right. Individual accused persons may be reported to COPFS for multiple charges. So, for example, in relation to contravention of Section 5, an accused person might be reported, and we, we have an instance of this, for 10 separate charges of a contravention of Section 5, so 10 separate incidents of contravention of a dog control notice. Yep. That would be 10 separate charges, but the prosecution of that individual would represent one prosecution and one conviction. Right. Statistics are available, and they do point to the challenges faced by both the police and COPFS in relation to proving charges under both the 1991 Act and the 2010 Act. I have those statistics available today and can provide those to the committee. Well, that's good. That's good. But if we could get those circulated to the committee, because clearly that matters each stage of the process and what happens at each stage and how long it takes and so on. Because we certainly in the previous panel from people who were victims also uh, took evidence which was quite critical both of the police uh, and of local authorities, but also um, of what happened or didn't happen in terms of prosecution. So there's clearly an issue in there that we, we need to address. So that would be extremely helpful if we could get that uh, information. Um, can I also ask, one, one of the things that strikes me is the low numbers. Um, we, the evidence, we had some medics give us evidence, uh, medical professionals, um, gave us evidence about the number of people at, who turn up at A&E as a result of dog attacks. And across Scotland, I think the total figure is estimated to be of the order of 5,000 per year. Um, now, what worries us, I think, is you know the evidence from these people, from medics, and, and a lot of these, uh, are, if they're turning up at A&E, it's serious enough to turn up at A&E, and some of them are very serious indeed. But given 5,000 people turn up in Scotland every year as a result of dog attacks, and we end up, last, for the last year figures are available, 17, 18, we end up with 10 prosecutions and 10 convictions under the Control of Dogs Act, and 105 prosecutions of which 82 led to convictions under the uh, Dangerous Dogs Act. Something's going wrong somewhere, surely. Um, uh, again, 5,000 versus these figures. Again, it may be useful if I clarify your area of interest. Are you interested in the numbers, the, the, dis the discrepancy between the numbers of incidents reported by medics and the numbers of reports made to the police and by the police to and COPFS? What I'm interested in is the, what, trying to reconcile the fact that there are 5,000 people turn up at A&E uh, as a result of dog attacks and yet that only leads to, under both acts, if you take the last year, the combined figure for both acts was 115 prosecutions, of which there were 92 convictions. Now, I'm not blaming, I'm not blaming anybody. I mean, one, clearly one contributing factor is that the medics are not obliged to report uh, these cases to the police um, unless they think it's very serious. And, and though that wasn't really defined, that was what we were advised. So clearly one reason for the discrepancy is the fact that every incident isn't reported by the medics because basically they won't do it without the patient's permission. And it's not always the case that the patient wants to report the incident. So that's one reason. But what I'm trying to find out from both the police and the prosecution service, from your perspective, why is there such a massive discrepancy between the number of people clearly injured as a result of dog attacks and the very relatively comparable low level of prosecutions and convictions? Well, if we could break that down into 
two particular sections and I'll maybe take up the second section, which yeah. is what happens to a case and the challenges faced by the Crown Office uh, when a case is reported to yeah. COPFS. But the committee may wish to hear from police colleagues in yeah. relation to the first stage, which is an incident occurs in the community and whether or not that incident is reported to Police Scotland and the challenges faced by Police Scotland. Yeah, back that up, Mr O'Neill. We're, we're aligned people reporting these incidents to us, and it, and it, it certainly looks to me as if there's an under-reporting. And I'd also be interested to know the circumstances of these incidents. For example, was it the family dog that bit someone? But I would accept that it looks as if there's been under-reporting. Um, since 2010, we've received a total of 8,234 reports. Um, not all of them are dog attacks or dogs being dangerous out of control. It's the five elements of dog legislation we have. So it's clearly nowhere near the, mm. the figures that are presenting to, to accident emergency. Um, there's also a lot of the dog bites that won't necessarily fulfil the criteria for a criminal case. Um, I'm quite sure amongst those dog bites, but I would suspect there's an element of under-reporting. Well, there is a rule being applied, which is not actually in the legislation, but there is a rule, I am, we understand, being applied by prosecutors that uh, if, it, if the dogs only uh, bit somebody once, they won't, they won't be prosecuted unless it's very serious. Uh, apparently that's in some guideline somewhere. No, I, I'm, I'm happy to answer that if it would assist the committee. Yeah. Um, th there is, uh, in, in reading the material for the committee today, I, we obviously came across reference to, I think, something some organisations have described as a one free bite rule. Yeah. There is no such rule. Um, there's no such rule either in law or in, or in our guidance. What we do have to comply with in any prosecution under the Dangerous Dogs Act is the statutory um, the, the statutory enactment which states what's required to constitute that offence, and we have to prove that by corroborated evidence. For the Dangerous Dogs Act, there's a statutory requirement that a dog shall be regarded as being dangerously out of control on any occasion on which there are grounds for reasonable apprehension that it will injure any person or assistance dog, whether or not it actually does so. And that phrase in the legislation has been interpreted by the Scottish courts. The decisions of the Scottish courts are binding upon us. In essence, what is required um, before we can um, successfully prosecute a case under dog, a Dangerous Dogs Act is to prove that there was reasonable apprehension that that, that, that dog would bite someone. Um, so we have to prove that uh, there's an element of foreseeability is brought in through those decisions. So if, for example, it's one incident and there's no history in relation to the dog, there's a very short incident, that will not satisfy in Scots law the requirements of that section. And that is where a number of the challenges around Dangerous Dogs Act offences, both for the police and for us, and in the understanding of it, because it's complex, it's not straightforward to come in. Satisfy the section of which piece of legislation? Section 3 of the Dangerous Dogs Act, as interpreted by the Scottish Courts. And you have to look at the Scottish Courts' um, decisions on that matter, which are binding on us. We'd be happy to share some of them with the committee. I think that would be very helpful, But, actually, but, but that, that is, um, and I think um, I saw reference to that in some of the submissions from some of the other parties in the case. Yeah. So, so basically what you're saying is that cases that have already been to court and the, the judiciary has decided that there has to be this proof, you, you have to prove that the dog would be likely to bite again, basically. Uh, is that what you're saying? There's got to be a reasonable apprehension um, that that dog um, would injure a person, and it is a person. So the assistance dog provision was brought in by Statute Amendment 2014. It's not a dog. So previous actions in relation to dogs maybe have limited relevance in proving this section. And that so, so can I ask you then, I'm not a lawyer, right? So if I hammer somebody, if I assault Anis, and I've never assaulted anybody in my life, by the way, but if I assault Anis uh, and it goes to court, <laughs> and it goes to court, I could go off because I'm not likely to assault anyone ever again. There's not necessarily any direct equivalent between the common law offences as we understand them relating to people and these offences relating to dogs. So 
Um, for example, an assault, as we understand it, is governed by common law. Dogs' offences are all governed by statute. They're all created by statute, and they depend on what the statute says. Secondly, there's another so, difference. Sorry to interrupt you. So even if it's a serious bite, and it's the first time the dog is recorded as having bitten anybody, but if it's a serious bite, um, will the and you're saying you still might not take that to court because the judiciary are likely to say, you, you know, if you can't prove it's likely to do it again? The, if what we are talking about is a, is a very serious bite, it would depend, it all depends in every case on the facts and circumstances of the case, but the severity of the bite in and of itself would not be sufficient in itself to satisfy the requirements of the dangerous So if the dog mulls a child... The judiciary is likely to let the dog off the hook. It's not necessarily a, qu it's a question. Well, you of won't what even take it to the court because they're likely to make that kind of decision. It's not about whether or not the judiciary are likely to make that decision. It's whether or not there's a sufficiency in law with reference to the relevant statute. So the law is strong enough, Mr. McGee. Well, to protect children. The law is an ass. It sounds as though. Is that right? <laughs> the, no, the law is what it is. Yes. It, it is from your or, point of view. From our point of it, view, yeah. It, it is. It is whether or not the law reflects or addresses the particular need or risk identified, but the law is what it is. No, I understand that. But so, so just to be absolutely clear, if a dog bites for the first time a child and mauls that child, disfigures that child, if you can't persuade the judge, or you think you can't persuade the judge or the sheriff that the dog is likely to bite again, you might not take it to court. I mean, how bad does it need to be for the for the justice system, including prosecutors and judges, to uh, what about justice for the child and their family? Well, again, in terms of justice for the child and family, that that's perhaps not a question to ask of us as prosecutors. As prosecutors, we look to the law, mm. and it's whether or not the law captures the situation you describe in the way that the legislature thinks appropriate. But our reference point would be the relevant statutory offence that may be applicable to the particular circumstances of an individual case and whether or not the facts and circumstances of that individual case firstly meet the circumstances of the offence as set out by the relevant statute and secondly whether there is sufficient e e evidence of each element of that offence and again with reference to Scots law Sufficient evidence means evidence from more than one source in relation to each of those essential elements. Absolutely, but you have to satisfy all the criteria. And I think Mr Gibson was saying one of the criteria is to be able to persuade the judge that this dog is likely or possibly could bite again. It's not a question of again, it's about in the incident where the, the bite, if it's a bite we're talking about, has happened, that there was a reasonable apprehension that that dog would injure any person. So you're actually generally looking backwards to see if there's evidence of prior behaviour by that dog that might give rise to concern, whether in some particularly unique circumstances where it's a very long incident, whether the length of the incident and the way the dog and the owner has behaved in that incident can give rise to that apprehension. But generally, you're looking backwards, not forwards, to try and establish at the time the offence occurred whether there was a re reasonable apprehension of injury. That's what the case law, which is binding well, I think, on I think very clearly there's need, there needs to be a change in the law. This sounds absurd uh, to I me. I mean, it, it is absurd, and it's my strong view, listening to all the evidence, that actually the law is a lot harder on human beings that have a conscience yeah, and free absolutely. will than animals who can, can be completely out of control. And... And ask. I was say, just following up from Alec Neil's point, there is if you take the Jim Ferguson example from the first session with the five year old that was uh, mauled on the stage, that sounds like an argument that says the dog's never going to be on a music stage again with a five year old, so it's never going to attack a child again, so therefore no action should be taken against the individual that owned the dog or the dog itself. That just sounds absurd. It's not about whether we would want or not to take action in the circumstance of the case. It's whether, as, as prosecutors, there is sufficient evidence in law for us to prosecute that person for it. And to, if we're talking about that example, you would have to ha be able to establish there was a reasonable apprehension of injury to a person to be able to prosecute that case. 
Can um, we maybe, now, if we're going to talk about this case specifically, can we maybe refer this to Police Scotland? Because one of mm. my main concerns around the story Jim Ferguson told us, if I heard it correctly, was that police didn't bring charges. Why, why was that, Police Scotland? I, I don't know about this. I'm not aware of this particular of case. case. Sure, but I don't think it can be an isolated uh, incident. I, if you look at the statistics on prosecutions. Yeah, but what I would say, and I said I'm not referring to that particular case because I don't know the circumstances, but I think it is, as my colleagues from the Fiscal Service says, just because a dog bites someone, even severely, does not make the owner or the person in charge of it to be liable to a competent charge under the Dangerous Dogs Act. There has to be a reasonable apprehension. So I think my understanding in simple terms, if the person in charge of the dog had a pretty fair idea that the circumstances were such that it was out of control in a manner that might bite someone or give give rise to that fear, then that's a competent charge. But if if the bite, if you like, came out of the blue, then and the, the, the person in charge of the dog didn't know that was going to happen, then it's not necessarily a competent charge. I think that's the way I understand it in simple terms and probably one of the stated cases I know about is actually when a dog bit two children in a play park, but it was held an appeal that the, that the owner had no reasonable apprehension. Surely a crowded concert with loud music and dancing and a dog on a stage with a five-year-old is a reasonable apprehension that something bad might happen? I said I can't speak about the circumstances. But in general, sir, in general. I, I do understand it does, doesn't seem like an appropriate venue to have a dog, whether or not that but, amounts but to... You, but, but just in, in yeah. conversation, would you class that as being a reasonable apprehension that something bad might happen? Again, I'd, I'd need to know the full circumstances, but again, I'd say not, not necessarily. Um, there is dogs quite often in noisy, busy circumstances in parks, etc. But I said... I, I find it difficult to comment on a particular case because there's always context and circumstances that would have to be taken into account, both the police and the fiscal service. Alan Murray, we had evidence from Glasgow City Council, and I quote, there appears to be a lack of desire to take prosecution cases under the dangerous dogs legislation, but instead to, to refer it to local authorities. Is that the situation with Police Scotland? Well, that would not be my understanding. If there's a, an incident where there's a report and that there's a crime being committed under the Dangerous Dogs Act, and we think there's a sufficiency of evidence, or a sufficiency of evidence to present the case to the, case to the Procurator Fiscal for consideration, then we would make charges under it. But there would need to be a sufficiency of evidence. But we've also heard evidence that there are an increasing number of referrals back to local authorities from police and the Procurator Fiscal for dogs that have caused serious injury. Is that because of what the Crown Office have just described there about evidence. John McKay, you're nodding your head. Yes, it will be. It's because of that threshold to an extent whereby proving the reasonable apprehensiveness. It also, um, I would point towards the Scottish Crime Recording Standards too. Uh, the Scottish Crime Recording Board, which is chaired by the Scottish Government Justice Analytical Services, um, describes how all legislation and offences should be recorded. It's a document that's on the Scottish Government website. Um, I'm one referring to the Dangerous Dogs Act, Section 3, keeping uh, pro under proper control. It provides a scenario of a dog tied up on a short lead, perhaps outside a shop, and uh, bites a person walking past. Uh, it actually starts off by saying, this is not a police matter, as the dog was not dangerously out of control. Consideration should be given to reporting the matter to the local authority. The further note to that, though, is that police should investigate in the first instance um, if a person is bitten by a dog, that is certainly to establish whether, um, under the full circumstances as the police know them to be, whether that crime has actually taken place or not. Um, okay, let me put Jim Ferguson's story to you. Mm -hmm. If the five-year-old girl had been disfigured by an assault that was that I had assaulted her, would there have been an immediate charge against me? Well, that comes back to what our colleagues are saying, that under common law, with an assault there's not that requirement that there is under statute under the Dangerous Dogs Act yeah. for that reasonable apprehensiveness. And the, you know... I, I would be charged immediately for that crime against that be, child. Yes, there's that disconnect between okay. what happens between humans and common law... But dogs get a second those, chance. Th well, I wouldn't necessarily put it as that. It's that the law provides 
what the circumstances are when an offence can be proven to have been sure. committed. Le okay. Liam Kerr. Briefly, since we're on this, uh, if I may, Jim Ferguson uh, told us about an operating procedure. He showed us a couple of times an operating procedure uh, that said when it was with, something was in Police Scotland's remit. Uh, but he suggested that elements of Police Scotland were not aware of this or not enforcing it. So can I just ask, do you accept the procedure, do you, Police Scotland, accept that that procedure exists? Is it clear, uh, and do you accept that not all of the areas of the force know about it? I think the answer is yes. The procedure that I described where we should be reporting things to the, to the, the local authorities, absolutely that protocol is there. Um, I think there is an inconsistency, and I think one of the, the council reps said that not all beat cops are aware of it. Mm -hmm. And certainly from our investigations into this, it was I would accept that there is an inconsistency across the country. Um, and it's quite often mirrored by the... Commitment isn't the right word, but the councils who have dog wardens and have put that investment into the dog warden, wardens, it seems to be mirrored by the police, um, that there's far better information sharing. But I would accept that there will be police officers who will not be aware that if there is not enough for a charge under the Dangerous Dogs Act, that they would then they should then refer it to the local authority for consideration of a of a control order. Um, so, I think I think it's a fair comment that it would be inconsistent across the country, and that's reflected by the investigations we've carried out prior to coming here today. Thank you, thank you for your candour. On whom does the onus lie? to remedy that situation within Police Scotland? We're currently reviewing our procedures for matters relevant to dogs, and I think when that's been reviewed, it would be incumbent in the force to make sure that's, that's disseminated and, re and, and reinforced. And certainly that would be rec a recommendation ar arising from, from these hearings that we need to be sure that uh, across the country that there is sufficient knowledge that when cops are dealt to deal with dog attacks, they know that. What I would say is it's clearly there's a lot of dog reports, but it's not something that police officers will deal with day in, day out. Um, statistically, it's very unlikely in the course of any one year that a specific beat cop, if you like, will deal with this, which maybe contributes to it. But I think I think there is definitely a gap that that we need to address in that knowledge. Thank you. Willie Coffey, you're the supplementary. Thanks, Jenny. I wonder if I could ask our colleagues from the Fiscal Service to just clarify the issue about reasonable apprehension, please. Just forgive me for asking again. Um, did you say that even in, if it's established and clear that a, an attack has taken place and a bite has taken place, that the priority is still given to reasonable apprehension being demonstrated over the fact that an attack has taken place? not a question of priority, it's a question of what the law requires us to, to prove, and it requires us to prove by corroborated evidence that there was a reasonable apprehension of injury. So simply a bite would not be enough in and of itself, except perhaps in special circumstances. Goodness, goodness. Thanks. Thank you. OK. OK, thank you. Colin Beatty. Um, we've had some evidence that there's uh, not a great deal of joined-upness between councils, police and so forth in this. Where a case has originally been pursued under the Dangerous Dogs Act 1991 and there's no action being taken, is there a process for referring this to the local authority uh, for action under the 2010 Act? Yes, that, the, the protocol that was referred to, that if we are investigating a case under the Dangerous Dogs Act and there is not a sufficiency of evidence, evidence to report it to the Procurator Fiscal, we should then refer that to the local authority for consideration of action under the 2010 Act. Should, but does it happen? There seems to be no evidence it, that effect. It, it's difficult to tell how often it happens and it, and it doesn't. And again, because there is no database, that it's difficult to tell how many times it's been referred and but what must actually happens. Yeah, a process, again, process. That's potentially incumbent upon the relationship with the local authority, and it's been discussed earlier the investment there and in the police. But certainly, our, our, our protocol and our guidance is that if we're dealing with a, a dog that has been out of control, um, then we should certainly be informing the local authority of that. And whilst we could uh, continue our investigation in terms of the criminal offence, the dog control notice is a civil 
ODA and the local authority. The, we work best when we work in collaboration, um, and it's that information sharing that is so important. Jumping on again about that information, we spoke. Oh, sorry, the, the earlier committee was talking about the dog control notice register that has not been implemented nationally. That could potentially be a great form of evidence that if we know that a dog has uh, previously had a dog control notice applied to it in, in a different part of Scotland, um, then if we're building a case about under the Dangerous Dogs Act, and we can demonstrate that proof that there's been uh, a dog control notice or there's been warning letters or whatever it may be, then that, that would contribute towards that. But it seems a bit ad hoc. You're saying it depends on the relationship locally, effectively. I think, I think it... I'm not sure if I talk to the description of Jews, but there is, in, in some respects, a disconnect. And I think some of it comes from there is no single point of information with with the database that's been talked about. That the information would be cross-checked both lo across local authorities and between the police and local authorities to see what actions have been taken before, what reports have been made before. Um, and I think that's... But, John's talking about about that information sharing is probably where that disconnect comes. That when we supply information, if we supply the information, then what happens to that information? Then there is no national database that that goes on. So that would be certainly when it comes to proving a case of the Dangerous Dogs Act. Certainly proving that a dog has has previously been subject to an investigation that's been dangerously out of control would certainly give rise to the fact that there might have been reasonable apprehension that it might be again. Um, I, think, I, I, think, I think there's sufficient evidence being put forward saying that a national database would be desirable and certainly make a difference. However, sh that shouldn't stop um, cases being referred to local authority where they have failed to be prosecuted under the under the Dangerous Dogs Act 1991. It's not just whether no, it fails to be prosecuted, it should be... Both it should be both that at all times when there's information about an out of control dog within the community, that the local authority dog warden is made aware of that, mm -hmm. and the police can investigate to establish whether any criminal offences have taken place. So, so would the dog warden be aware that the uh, the case had been dropped or whatever? No. May I come yeah. in there without input from police yeah. or whatever? Um, I noted in, in the earlier se session that the committee does not appear to have a copy of the relevant protocol, but this issue is covered within the protocol, and I would ask the committee to view the lens or view some of the evidence that the committee has heard from individual local authorities through the lens of the protocol and what the protocol provides for in relation to interaction between the 1991 Act offence and the 2010 Act offence. So, in relation to the protocol at page five. The second paragraph provides that it is important to note that whilst the policy presentation of the 2010 Act has often been in the context of the DCN regime being, about being trying to prevent attacks from taking place, the law itself does not restrict imposition of a DCN to only where attacks have not taken place. Given the discussion about uh, the 1991 Act, which is fully discussed within the terms of the protocol, and that discussion has been mirrored this morning in terms of the, challenge, or the challenges faced by prosecutors and police in relation to the 1991 Act, it provides that it can be the case that imposition of a DCN may be appropriate for cases originally considered under the 1991 Act, but where a lack of evidence exists to support a prosecution. And so the, the system operated by COPFS is that where a case cannot be taken forward by COPFS. It is not the case that a prosecution has failed, but rather that the prosecutor cannot take the case, matter, the case forward as a result of the evidential tests that must be met with reference to the 1991 Act. Prosecutors will ask the police to refer the matter to the relevant local authority. And that is the process that was described by some of the witnesses this morning. And some of the witnesses this morning described what we understand to be a complementary approach whereby if an offence cannot be taken forward in terms of the 1991 Act, there is an opportunity uh, for the local authority con to consider action in relation to dog control notice because of the different evidential tests that must be met in relation to that DCN and also, as my police colleague has said, with reference to the future. 
that that DCN might well be a reference point should that dog misbehave in the future and there an opportunity be, be available again to consider whether or not a prosecution in terms of the 1991 Act is available. There's a process for automatically referring this to the local authority. Is that process working? We, we, in every case that we can't take up a case under the Dangerous Dogs Act, ask the police to refer it to the local authority. Yes. That is part of our guidance. Okay, so you ask the police to refer it. Do the police refer it? We should, and in some occasions we do, but I think there have been failings. Um, clearly, the statistics would tend to suggest that we don't in all occasions, and maybe that there should be a tighter process for that. I think that's what we're seeing, that there's processes and so forth in place and protocols in place, but they're not really being adhered to. That would be my impression. Thank you. OK. Um, Bill Bowman. Convener, just a question. If, if a dog attacks, let's say, a postal worker or a police officer and the, while they're carrying out their duties, as opposed to a random attack on a member of the public, is, is there any different way you can deal with that dog? No, the same law would apply. You might have better evidence, perhaps, but apart from that... Uh, well, again, we may have better evidence, but there may be different evidential challenges. Um, so, again, if you think about the law in Scotland in relation to the requirement for corroboration. So we need evidence from at least two sources of each essential element. And if you think about the circumstances in which a postman or a postwoman may be bitten by a dog, um, the, the challenge is in identifying two sources of evidence for each of the essential elements of the offence um, in relation to those circumstances. So there's no particular protection for the police, let's say, carrying out their duties? Can I ask the panel, we had evidence, I think you were all here to hear the first panel, uh, we heard evidence saying there was a lack of understanding among prosecutors of the law on this. Can I ask the Crown Office to respond to that, please? Um, we would reject that evidence. Um, there, are, there, are, there is specific guidance for prosecutors in relation to each of the relevant offences. These offences um, are marked by specialist prosecutors, and I note the source of that evidence. And that evidence was given in connection with the interaction between COPFS and local authorities in relation to consideration of a DCN. And what was described was increasing referrals uh, to a local authority in circumstances where a prosecution had failed. Again, I would challenge that language and understanding and challenge that the referral um, of a case where a prosecution is not possible to a, DC, to a local authority is not appropriate and is, and is not actually evidence of good practice on the part of COPFS and good knowledge on the part of prosecutors as to options that may be available and should be considered in circumstances where a prosecution cannot take place. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Can I also put another piece of evidence that we've heard to the Crown Office, uh, we heard that um, local authorities often receive requests from Procurator Fiscal for dog control notices to be served on dogs whose owners await prosecution under the Dangerous Dogs Act. goes on to say there is a suspicion that this may be to avoid the costs incurred with seizing and kenneling dangerous dogs until the owner's case reaches court. Is that correct? Uh, absolutely not. So um, I noticed that the allegation was a suspicion rather than one based on evidence. Um, the protocol makes quite clear that in cases where we cannot take action, um, we will refer cases to the council. Again, like my colleague referred to, those comments seem to um, not take nicence of that section in the protocol, which clearly um, expresses and makes clear that such referrals will happen. When we um, do not have a sufficiency of evidence, we will ask, and the police do, in my general experience, refer on those referrals to the, uh, the relevant local council to consider whether or not the dog warden can take action in respect of it. Um, and it may be that there's a misunderstanding of what stage in the process that happens, because, of course, our case stays live until we close it. But we will have taken our decision about sufficiency. We will wait um, in terms of recording the steps we take in the case to close the case until we have had that communication with the police. And the Are police you saying that you make the judgment 
on whether you seize and kennel a dog or give it a dog control, refer it back to the council for a dog control notice on the sufficiency of evidence that you have. Should the test not be public safety? For instance, okay, so a dog has bitten a child and there's a prosecution pending under the Dangerous Dogs Act but you refer it back to the council for a dog control notice, which you have no, um, you have no sense that it may that dog control notice will be adhered to. Is it not more in the public interest and public safety that you seize and kennel the dog? And it comes back to the sufficiency of evidence. So the police will have made a decision by that point whether to seize the dog or not, and the dog will. So that's be the police's decision. Because generally, they will be the first people dealing with the. Uh, but with the, the evidence says that they received requests from the procurator fiscal for DCNs to be served on dogs? This is the evidence of the local authorities, yes. can I clarify? So um, we will have made a decision about whether there is a sufficiency of evidence to prosecute the owner or the person in control of that dog by yes. the time. And if there isn't, we will then, because we can do nothing more at that point, because we do not have a sufficiency of evidence, we will refer the matter on to the local authority to see if there's any steps they can take in terms of their powers under the Dogs Control Act. As a responsible public authority, that's obviously a proper thing for but us to But that's a do. different scenario than the one I've just put to you in evidence. You're saying whether there's sufficiency of evidence, i.e. you might not prosecute. It, but this, this piece of evidence says where while the owner is awaiting prosecution. I'm concerned that what you're telling me is you're making a decision on a very legal point, the sufficiency of evidence, Whereas there's a public safety issue here. Basically, you're making a decision as to whether to leave the dog in the community with no guarantees that it's going to behave, rather than seizing it and kenneling it after it's bitten a child. No, that's, not, that's not our evidence. And again, I return to... No, that's the local authority. Uh, but that's not, that's not the situation. Um, and I return to my opening evidence in connection with the legal framework within which a prosecutor must operate. So there has to be a sufficiency of evidence before a prosecutor can act uh, and can take prosecutorial action. Where we are referring cases to a local authority for consideration of a DCN is where there is insufficient evidence to allow the prosecutor ah. to take action. So you're saying that seizing and kennelling is a prosecutorial action? No. Seizing, seizing and kennelling takes place before the case is reported to COPFS. So that the case is reported to COPFS with the dog potentially having been seized and kennelled. The decision for COPFS at that stage is whether or not there is sufficient evidence for us to take prosecutorial action. If there is insufficient evidence, we cannot take action. If there is insufficient evidence, we cannot move on to the public interest test. If there is insufficient evidence for us to take prosecutorial action, would be unlawful. So, we cannot take action, and in light of that fact, that is when we were referring the matter to local authority, because there is an opportunity, as set out in the protocol, for a local authority to take action in connection with a DCN yeah. and to try and address those public safety issues that you've highlighted. I, th I think my point still stands. You could still have the situation under what you're telling me, that a dog bites, a severe bite of a child, and because you don't have sufficient evidence, the dog's left in the community and is just given a DCN rather than being seized and kenneled. Yeah, well, again, that comes back to what a prosecutor can lawfully do. Yeah, OK, I understand that. Willie Coffey. Again, hey, colleagues, again, but sufficiency of evidence, is that by people witnessing it independently, or does it include the injury? Is the injury contributing to the sufficiency of evidence test? Um, there is, there is a requirement for evidence of injury in connection with an aggravated offence in terms of the 1991 Act. Um, I would encourage the committee to look at the terms of the 1991 Act, both in terms of the, the, the offence and the interpretive section in terms of Section 10 of the 1991 Act. That's what prosecutors are referring to. Um, so we, we, we're required to prove injury in terms of um, an aggravated offence under the 1991 Act, but but I think you're perhaps asking whether or not injury would would lead or, or form part of the case in relation to reasonable apprehension, and the answer to that is not. Goodness, right. Thank you. Okay. Do members have any further points for the panel? Alec, just then quick, Liam. Just a quick one. I, we've heard contradictory evidence in terms of the application of the Data Protection Act. I mean, you heard this. We had previous evidence uh, as well, but uh, this morning you heard that one local authority, East Ayrshire, 
uh, where a dog control notice has been issued, um, issues to the complainer, the contents of the dog control provision notice provision, without naming the um, uh, culprit. Um, whereas I think it was in Glasgow, um, they said they don't go as, even as far as that because of data protection. There seemed to be a, a real variability about the interpretation of the Data Protection Act. From the COPF point of view, um, wh who's right? You know, in terms of the Data Protection Act, um, can can you issue uh, the complainer with the detail of the content and the conditions of the control notice, or can't you? It's not for COPFS as criminal prosecutors to offer a view on the operation of a civil regime by a local authority and their compliance with data protection obligations. Okay. Uh, briefly, if I may, Police Scotland, the, uh, uh, you heard me ask earlier on about fixed penalty notices, uh, which have been brought up by uh, at least one of the councils. Does Police Scotland have any view on fixed penalty notices for breach of a DCN? And specifically, is it more, would it be more efficient, in your view, uh, for a minor breach? And if so, what's a minor breach? It, it may be more efficient. I think uh, probably a range of disposals for any offence or crime um, is can be helpful um, if it, as long as it doesn't overcomplicate things complicate things a minor what would constitute a minor breach it depends on the terms i mean in, in many respects the things that go on dog control orders are, are to stop it presenting a danger so i suppose you could argue that if any of those conditions wasn't fulfilled and the danger presented it, it would it would represent a breach um possibly it would be the uh, again it would be the circumstances and the context and, and the result of, of whatever action it was um, would would guide what the disposal should be. But I think a fixed penalty may well be an option um, for breaches. It would add to your toolkit? In principle, I think it would add to the toolkit, yes. Grand. Uh, final question, just for anyone on the panel. I also asked earlier on about an offence of obstruction. Uh, do any of you take a view on whether that would be a useful addition to the toolkit? It would be, um, if if the orders are, if there if there's an order issued and the person who the order applies to does not comply with the order or the spirit of the order, then I think there has to be some sort of sanction or mechanism for making sure they do in simple terms. So again, in principle, I think I would support that. Thank you. Members have any further points for our witnesses this morning? Can I thank you all very much indeed for your evidence? I now close the meeting to the public as the committee moves into private session. Thank you.